Welcome. And I'm uh, both honored and uh, humbled for being on the stage with such great artists and art historians. I also can't help ask myself, what am I doing here? And I think I'll uh, blame my Italian origins uh, and the fact that Gaston loved Italy and Italian painters for this invitation of which I'm very uh, thankful for. I actually simply want to hear from our great panelists and guests. And so I would rather just start uh, from um, Kathy, who uh, I believe you were going first, I thought. It's yeah. yeah. Oh, Art is going first? Okay, yes. sorry. I, I, well, <laughs> we'll start with you, Art. Uh, I think it's alphabetical then, and uh, nomen omen. <laughs> so okay. we'll start with, uh, with Art. Uh, and I think the focus today is, uh, for our panel, the so-called late works, um, roughly, I think, from 72 to 79, 1980. If you have seen the exhibition, that is the last room in the show, which is a, a, an incredible room on itself. And uh, obviously, I'm sure uh, we'll have uh, many opportunities also to discuss the, the uh, 1970 Marlboro mm, exhibition, which I think you're also going to touch on, Art, uh, as uh, you present your view on uh, Gaston's work. And um, I think I'll let you take it away. And... Uh, and see where you take us. Okay, so I should confess that um, I grew up as a slob snob. If it wasn't on newsprint, I had no use for it. Um, and as a result, my approach to painting in museums was um, wary. And as I began to read more and look more and moved closer toward uh, a center rather than an edge. I was living on that center of the hyphen between high art and low art, with whatever those things are. Uh, that Stumblebum versus Mandarin, I represented the Stumblebum team and had to find members of the other tribe that I could relate to. So George Gross came easily, for example. Um, Steinberg, who hovered close to uh, that hyphen as well, came easily enough. Uh, and I didn't know whether to start by showing a clan painting, since that's obviously the, the, the electric charge, or this Nixon thing. But the Nixon thing is where I realized, wow, he really is in the tradition of, car of the great cartoonists, the Dorniers, the political artists, uh, with his uh, San Clemente painting uh, that I saw about September 15th or so. You know, the show had just opened at the McKee Gallery on September 11th, showing his Poor Richard cartoon drawings of uh, a triangle-headed uh, Agnew and a pair of glasses representing Kissinger and a dick representing Dick Nixon. And culminating was this uh, large portrait scale uh, picture of Nixon that seemed to me like a... Um, uh, virulent, politically angry cartoon, large size, belonging in the Hall of pr uh, Presidential Portraits uh, as the most logical place for it. And it expressed his anger, but it also expressed something else, which was uh, his empathy. You know, there's this thing where it's like, oh, that leg must really hurt you, motherfucker, huh? Yeah, I see your crocodile tear, but gee, it must hurt, hey? It really hurts. Yeah, I know what that means. So that's a, a, a much fuller dialogue than the usual political caricature of your enemy as monster. Uh, there's much to say about this picture. Uh, but the paint handling is, and the scale was something that allowed me entry into a lot of things. Because for me, next, next slide. Next slide, I was told to yeah, just say next slide. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this was a uh, lithograph I made right before the year 2000. Uh, that 2001 show was amazing to me when I first left my neighborhood uh, to see the uh, Poor Richard exhibit uptown. Uh, when I got out of the elevator, there's this giant American flag. And then inside that gallery were these... Um, seditious paintings, and it made me so proud to be an American at that second, in a way that none of the Stars and Stripes patriotic uh, uh, 
bullying could. Uh, because finally, I was able to accept uh, Gustinez in this um, picture I made about 1998 or 2000, a, a lithograph uh, called Lead Pipe Sunday. Um, it, I, I had to place Gustin, represented here by the Cyclops head, uh, in the great achievements and monuments of my medium, comics, uh, that he was a member of that tribe, ultimately, working in a much subtler way than most. And near the center of the picture, right at the fold, it's at the center of this large uh, lithograph that was the same size as, the, as an old broadsheet newspaper, that crease is being banged into by a red brick. And that brick is uh, Crazy Cat's brick uh, showing up over there. And they are in very close proximity. Um, so next is this trajectory between high and low. Um, Rob Storr and I have gone around this over and over again, uh, how I, of course, knew Zap first, because Zap was from immediately my world, the underground comics. And it was a return of the repressed. Uh, at the time in the 60s, when er all hell broke loose then, uh, the epitome of cartooning was closer to Charles Schultz, the less is more kind of cartooning, uh, uh, a kind of sophistication that came with post Paul Clay abstraction, whether consciously or un. And Crumb's work brought back all of the hairy, gritty, blue collar, proletarian, uh, bare light bulb cartooning with its scritchy lines. Um, and I couldn't help but see say that clan car chugging off on the right uh, as coming right out of a Zap comic. And it was certainly uh, in relation to it, like that uh, picture of um, Nixon as a, a dick uh, was appearing in underground newspapers at the same time as the political cartoons. And how that all came about, I can't know but because uh, I couldn't prove it, I couldn't put a date on it. But for me, it feels like there was something in the air. I believe Crumb got there first, and either because of his own real background, uh, Gustin got there as well, or more, more likely, I believe, he saw some underground newspaper and it catalyzed all of his earlier repressed cartooning as opposed to the more sophisticated kind he'd been doing up to that point. Okay, so uh, me, just a cartoonist trying to be an underground comics artist at the age of 18. Next slide. Uh, so this was when Playboy magazine was trying to appropriate uh, underground comics in their Playboy funny section at a time where Playboy was still able to have some degree of credibility as a liberal uh, thinking magazine before uh, the centerfolds became too embarrassing, but when they were able to have interviews with Lenny Bruce and whatever. Uh, so I was trying to do an underground com comic that was cleaned up enough for them, and I figured what could be better for a men's magazine that celebrated uh, women's bodies and bodies to have a head as the uh, character, just a, a head lying on the ground thinking. Next slide. Uh, I was m more in dialogue with um, Gustin's heads by not 1970s when I was doing these Playboy things, but uh, around the year 1998 to 2000, when I was putting them in dialogue with each other. Uh, so this is from my sketchbook at the time. It's, uh, oh, it's too hard to try to show you the, the balloons in this and stuff, but I will point to uh, a little note that I'd made in my sketchbook, which was uh, Ken Jacobs, the filmmaker friend of mine, and I um, were watching uh, looking at, at Gustin Payton's drawings of his uh, drawings he was making with poets at the time. And uh, Ken Jacobs, who was really brought up on abstract expressionism, it was his orthodoxy, studied with Hans Hoffman, made films but informed by uh, that plasticity. He's looking at these pictures and said, very admiringly and saying, you know, Gustin invented a new ism, fuckamism. And that leap from uh, Mandarin to Stumblebum uh, won my allegiance. Uh, so it goes way back for him, the Stumblebum roots. Next slide. 1926, the same moment that um, uh, 
that march was taking place with the Klansmen in Washington was his first published comic strip. Uh, Rustin was a member of the J Junior Cartoonist America Club or something, uh, and had just been given a cartoon correspondence course by his mother as a gift to encourage his interest in cartooning. And I think that that bottom strip, the first thing he'd ever published, which won a prize, was published in the LA Times as uh, uh, a reward. And it's a character called Little Snowball, minstrel-lipped, cue ball head. And in the light of the response to uh, the Klan paintings that led to that uh, canceling postponement of Gustin Now's show, I would say it's important to understand that Gustin was not a racist. He was a cartoonist. And cartooning just comes with that territory, the territory of imagine a language where every word was pejorative. Uh, so that you could say something like, um, uh, that, uh, that kike, he gypped me. Um, he was an Indian giver. And that's about all you could say in this language, because it's a language of heightened caricature and insult that leads to the simple stylized cartooning at its root. Next slide. Uh, so this is a correspondence course, not the one Gustin took, but one from 1908. Uh, it's uh, in a small space ad in magazines like Popular Mechanics. Uh, the small visual cut that attracts you to it is one of the more horrific versions of that minstrel-faced black man, right? Uh, it's what you have to learn, the vocabulary you have to learn to become a cartoonist, even though now that image might seem shocking. It did uh, the copy, which I don't know if I can read on the Bigger screen here, Scott. Yeah, if among the shocks, you can easily earn twenty to two hundred dollars a week, uh, which is amazing for most cartoonists. That's still true, a uh, hundred plus years <laughs> later. Um, so the nature of cartooning is you have to learn a visual vocabulary, a sign system, a way of handwriting. Next slide. It's uh, you have to learn to draw types: the fat woman, the stupid man, the thug. And it's a physiognomic code that you're learning. So that code seems like um, it's only designed hurtfully, and yet it wasn't used hurtfully all the time. Like, next slide. One of the probably greatest cartoons already evoked by that brick, uh, Philip Guston, uh, admired Crazy Cat. And Crazy Cat was drawn, as we now know, didn't Guston couldn't have known it back then, uh, that George Harriman, the artist, was uh, colored, passing for white uh, since his early years. Uh, lived in New Orleans, a great book biography by Michael Tisserand uh, called Crazy. Really outlines very specifically uh, his place on the hierarchy of uh, freed slave, colored, uh, mulatto, whatever, where exactly Gustin was, but he was passing. Otherwise, he would never have been allowed to work in a newspaper cartoon office uh, for Hearst in uh, the teens. And he would draw sports cartoons, like uh, pictures of, uh, uh, in the Johnson-Jeffries fight, of um, Johnson as a black boxer who beat up this white uh, uh, contender. And he drew him as a minstrel. Uh, it wasn't out of animus. It wasn't even necessarily out of fear. It's just that that was the handwriting you're given. Crazy Cat, I'm gonna go to the next slide and then go back to this one. Um, Crazy Cat was admired by Guston. He also admired uh, Mutton Jeff. Mutton Jeff being much more raffish, it started by taking place at a racetrack. It was fully the uh, bare light bulb hanging in a room with cracked plaster, a school of cartooning. Uh, and and it didn't take advantage usually of the fact that that bare light bulb that hung above Guston's head in a lot of these paintings is also the idea sign in cartooning for idea. But that was fully present in a way for Harriman because Harriman's comic strip is the only one that used symbols without the rigidity of the symbols that they represented. So here's a Sunday page in which I think I'm, well, no, I won't turn around, but I, I'll, I think I'll get it right. Uh, he, uh, it's the three panels that make up the love triangle that's at the heart of Crazy Cat, about a cat, a mouse, and a dog. The first one is the, I'm sorry. Yes, Ignat's mouse is saying, he'll not foil me, that cop. 
the cop is uh, uh, rushing after him, saying, he'll not fool me, uh, that mouse. And Crazy Cat sits below, saying, he'll not fail me, that darling. So fool, foil, fail, part of the, uh, the, the triangle. But much more to the point is these three characters are symbols, but we don't know what the hell they're symbols of. It's just about a cat who gets hit by a brick, by a, that is thrown by a, an angry mouse who hates the cat. Is the cat male, female, changes gender with every uh, round of pronoun? The uh, cop loves crazy, hates Ignatz. Uh, throwing a brick at a cat is the only crime in the surreal world of Coconino County with shifting backgrounds. And uh, at the end of the almost every day's strip, the mouse ends up in a jail made of bricks. So. This thing feels really simple, so even a child can love it. The reason the strip ran for such a long time is Hearst's nephew loved seeing that cat hit by a brick, so it stayed alive even when it wasn't nearly as popular as Mutt and Jeff. But what's important to me is how they, it uses symbols, and I don't have the real word for it. I've just heard from Massimilio that the word is polysemi. Or polysemi. Yeah. Polysemi, okay. Uh, for me, I was calling it multivalent uh, or metamorphing metaphors. But what it is is it's a symbol that's not stable. Unlike the types in cartooning, the big jaw, the, lo the, s the low forehead represents a thug, period. Uh, here in Harriman's world, essays have been written by the one strip that stood above the crowd as, you know, this is approaching art, poetry and art. Um, Gilbert Seldes, I think, was, no, I think it was E. Cummings that compared it to, okay, the uh, three characters. Uh, it's a political metaphor for fascism, anarchy, and democracy. Uh, the, the cop, the mouse, and the, uh, and the glorious cat representing democracy. Uh, another essay that I, uh, was out at the time uh, had it as superego, ego, and id and the brick as doing it, uh, which is maybe why a heart appears above uh, Crazy's head when he's hit by a brick. That fluidity was essential, because the problem with cartooning is that um, words eat their pictures. Content eats the image. When I was looking at these uh, uh, first paintings I could really love by Guston, uh, it was the fact that they were painterly, but they resolved into something, but the picture the meaning of the picture didn't disappear, but the the marks, the uh, crapola, the sloppiness was part of uh, the image itself. And what happens in comics is when you have the words, you have man holding brick, man throwing brick. It's an iconography, and after you see the image, unless you're sensitive to it, you're not even aware of the way the picture is drawn anymore. It's just a sign getting you through the narrative. And for Gustin, this was uh, finding a necessary component to be able to return back to his comics roots to keep the image alive the way uh, a painting asks to be, to have a long half-life. So uh, maybe let's go back for a moment, because one thing that's, could you go backward one slide? Yeah, um, yeah. So this was a daily Harriman strip of Crazy Cat in which, sorry, I'll have to do this again. I didn't realize I wouldn't be able to read it from uh, there, but it's like, can you, you can probably read it easier than me. Uh, uh, a study in black and white basically says the art critic. He means us, me black, you white, calls us studies too, the whim wham. Uh, let's fool them, you, you be black and I'll be white. Wonderful idea, let's do it. Here he comes, after we fool him, we'll uh, laugh at him titteringly. Yes, out loud. Aha, he, he comes back, uh, the critic, and says, another study in black and white. So we didn't know that this meaning was current as well as whatever other ways you wanted to look at these three characters with multivalent symbol, but that fluidity between black and white uh, for Harriman was important, urgent, and it was true as well for uh, Gustin in his career as he moved into uh, thinking about himself as a Jew who had uh, changed his name. Uh, next slide, and the one after. Uh, I love The Street by uh, Augustine, 1970. It's one of the many examples of his big feet, those sold feet, which for me are one of the ultimate uh, among several uh, polysemic images. Uh, 
of uh, uh, metamorphing meta uh, uh, metaphors. Those feet, on the one hand, uh, they're the cartoon feet that come out of Mutt and Jeff, but they're also uh, something else. They, they have lots of uh, inference and meaning. Sometimes, as in this picture, they seem like what's called in my trade the plop take, uh, which is when uh, Jeff says something stupid, Mutt plops out of the panel and just leaves his feet showing. And this is, uh, in fact, from a Popeye strip, a cartoonist explaining what a plop take is by uh, performing it as for Popeye, who's looking for cartoonists to work for his newspaper, a uh, fragment of that daily strip. But it has lots of meanings, you know? Like, on the one hand, uh, it's that. On the other hand, uh, it's also, next slide, uh, the monument to uh, the piles of Auschwitz bodies. Uh, but some of those tangled uh, legs and, and big feet uh, also uh, can be orgiastic in other pictures. They can be silly in some of the pictures. If you know his biography, other meanings start coming into view, like uh, in Gustin's story, his uh, brother died uh, uh, as a trainman of gangrene when um, uh, a train ran over his legs. His father was a blacksmith, and those horseshoe-like shoes are part of the story. But there's also this incredibly sober version of shoes that appear in his later pictures where it's uh, it's not as life-affirming as Harriman or perhaps Mutt and Jeff, but it's, it's, it's just a moving cartoon icon in his hands. Obviously, uh, these things were important to me when I was working on my monument, my next slide, uh, my 13-year-long yardside candle uh, recapping my father's story with my Jewish guilt matching up and running into uh, Gustin's guilt at having perhaps avoided something mine from having a success built on so much death. Anyway, I was told to keep this real short, so I'm doing it my best to wander through. Uh, next image is um, an image I just uh, did last year, so-called Trump Loy. It's a lithograph. Uh, I th thought it would be appropriate for showing uh, when we're talking about Gustin on the edge at a moment when America is going over the edge and many people haven't quite noticed yet or are eager for the moment, but that we'll all crash down and land at the lower right among one of Gustin's Klansmen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Um, now we know why you tend to publish your uh, novels in volumes, no? Uh, rather than uh, uh, in one shot, but before I, I end on the, the floor to Cathy, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, in a sense, as a historian now of cartoons rather than as an author, um, one is if you can tell us what the position of cartoons was in America in the 50s uh, and 60s, the moment in which uh, um, Gaston uh, appropriates their language. You know, on one hand, uh, we know cartoons were uh, um, perceived as seditious enough that McCarthy was trying to censor them as corrupting forces against uh, the youth of America. Um, we know there was Mad Magazine before Zap. That, that's not true. Well, uh, let me finish the question that's and the then you can answer. The first part just isn't true. It was the liberal uh, Democrats the jealous of McCarthy. Oh, it was the liberal Democrats jealous of McCarthy who wanted to have their own program that went after comics. Okay. Well, and so there, there was anyway a desire to censor comics because they were um, immoral, and I think that's uh, maybe something that played in, in in the iconography that Gaston used. And the second question is uh, rather than Zap Comics, the role of uh, Mad Magazine and uh, and that peculiar uh, narrative form that I think uh, Gaston must have been um, inspired by. You know, he says as much as he realized he wanted is work to tell stories. And I think the, the sort of uh, convulsive narratives of M Mad Magazine must have played a role. And also this uh, ability that Mad Magazine had of being critical of mass culture and being uh, settled in mass culture. No? I think that's a, a very um, interesting position also for the work of Gaston later on, which is uh, a, a a reflection on both complicity and proximity and, uh, uh, and not a clear moral stand, which is obviously what 
makes some people nervous, or, or anyway, a complicated moral stance. Um, so I don't know if you have any thought about um, how cartoons were placed and experienced, let's say, in the 50s and early 60s, and what would have meant for Gaston to, to look for his iconography there. And also going back to cartoons, uh, I should you know, remember that the word comes from the cartoons of frescoes that uh, uh, Gaston so much loved. And so that's, uh, you know, to go back to what Rob was saying, it's a, a, a conflation of high and low, right, from the etymology of the word itself. Yeah, well, cartoons were, were thoroughly disreputable, leading uh, to the, the, the bonfire of comics, comics being burned uh, by, organ by auto de fe's organized by church groups and by schools uh, as a terrible poison for, the, for children. Uh, so hardly something to strive for. On the other hand, it was one of the last bastions of representational drawing that was still happening, illustrators and cartoonists much lower on the pecking order than uh, grand painters. So the only thing I could meet that was lower than me was a tattoo artist, you know? Uh, and there was that. But there's also the way um, pop art enters into this is kind of interesting because I think one of the things that was, uh, distinguishes Guston from uh, the Warhol and Lichtenstein thing is that they came along really struggling to find a place for themselves that wasn't non-representational. And the way they could do it was by saying, this isn't really um, a drawing of a woman crying. This isn't really a woman crying or a picture of a woman crying. This is a drawing of a drawing of a woman crying. So uh, look at how uh, the skin is just like little red uh, zipitone-like dots. Let's uh, look at how the line has no uh, personality. It's industrial looking. And uh, that was Lichtenstein's way in to finding a way back toward making images uh, rather than uh, paint. And the, the thing is that I find that Lichtenstein did no more for comics than uh, Warhol did for soup. And the, the thing is that Gustin was doing something else. He was embracing the meaning of comics, allowing them to have that picture writing, that visual language, and still be paint. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was urgent and something that couldn't be met with anything but opprobrium. And do you think by, we have seen some horrible examples of also what, you know, comics types were. And uh, do you think that appropriation was also a conscious uh, recognition of that complicated history? Or, you know, you could say, um, and this is maybe a little cheap psychoanalysis on my part, but you could say the comics were a sort of collective unconscious of America in its worst um, manifestations, and as such, uh, they, they presented a sort of, you know, perennially infant America that, that is moved by uh, racist thoughts and, and, and base desires. Well, Am I, I exaggerating, or no. do you think? No, I think it's true, but I think it's just true because that's, well, that's why Guston's um, uh, wearing a Klan mask and painting, you know? It's, uh, it, it is America, uh, and, and that he understands it with the, that kind of proximity that uh, um, comes with being able to somehow feel sorry for, sympathize with Nixon's pain, and also loathe him. Uh, that fusion is present in comics, because comics, if it's conscious or unconscious, and there's quite a range, just like with any other artist, of what's what in that bifurcation. Uh, it's really a matter of trying to find what's there, and, and what's there is that, that clan mask. It's basic uh, to uh, allowing us to know what we are, who we are, and, and how America functions. So I don't know to what degree uh, Guston, I, I know there was no condescension toward comics in Guston's work, even though uh, it surrounded him. Uh, certainly Picasso loved comics too as an influence. Uh, but. Here, I think it was, it was something else which had to do with uh, he didn't want to be dismissed as a mere cartoonist because car cartooning meant not taking on life and death issues uh, in an, a meaningful way. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to hand it over to Kathy, I believe. Now this is the order. <laughs> and uh, um, I think we, we 
asked you to think about, uh, or, or to give us a picture of where the late work particularly falls within the trajectory of Gaston's work and, uh, and also within the context of the New York art world or uh, art history at the time. And then I think we'll hand it over to George to talk about the later reception of Gaston and, and then continue the conversation. Thanks, Massimiliano. Um, can I have my first slide, please? And as we, as we heard with that fantastic presentation from Art, um, Philip Guston liked a good story, and so do we. His 1970 Marlborough exhibition has been dramatized over the years as a repudiation of not just his own earlier work, but abstract expressionism as a critical category, and still further, abstraction itself. That understanding relies on early shocked reactions by partisan critics and also on a 1977 statement by the artist himself who said that amidst the horrors of the war in Vietnam, he felt split. That split between politics and art echoes an earlier moment for Gustin and his peers in New York, the years in the wake of World War II of Hiroshima and Auschwitz, when they broke with post-Cubism, social realism, biomorphic abstraction, whatever they'd been doing to make what came to be called abstract expressionism, a term none of them liked at all. Um, their friends, critics Tom Hess and Harold Rosenberg, wrote about the war as a sudden lightning bolt that struck the artist's mid-career, tearing their lives in two. Can I have the next slide, please? Around 1950, Hess framed the change as a New Testament conversion story, with Saul struck by revelation on the road to Damascus becoming Paul. In 1970, people saw Gustin as a Paul changing back into Saul, like a Jewish Cinderella, to mix our fairy tales. But in fact, the story is far from a simple one of befores and afters. Gustin spoke his whole life about painting out of a constant state of tension. The two parts of himself are sometimes three or four, coexisting, if not comfortably. Can I have the next slide? In 1948, he saw Piero and Rembrandt as abstract. In 1960, he described his tonal paintings like Smoker as a figuration that people simply failed to recognize. In 1978, he said that the simple things visible in the world were already abstract in their mystery. As with many of his generation, the split between himself and the social world was always present. Any resolution was temporary. Um, this state of tension, ne next slide please, could be found around the post-war world in New York and Berlin. And here we have Georg Baselitz um, abstracted himself as the painter upside down in a world that still representa representational and um, in, in the normative orientation in New York and in Berlin, but also Lagos and Sao Paulo, as artists felt external and internal pressure to speak to political, national, ethnic, or racial conditions in opposition to the wish to make art that was universal or solely individual. The conflict was often framed as one between the local or in the inherited and the modern. And in this light, we might see Gustin's love for American comics, the 20s and 30s, as of a piece with Damas and Nwoko's attachment to knock terracottas working in Nigeria, or Izamo Noguchi's admiration for Japanese ceramics and stoneware. Affiliations expressed as a kind of political impulse, usually when in the global south, but often in the United States as a kind of Freudian wish to make art that appealed to one's family rather than to Clement Greenberg. And that was certainly true for Gustin as he, as he moved along, the wish to make things that an ordinary person could perceive and appreciate. The most common, ways for, for the most common way for artists to express these tensions was through abstraction and figuration in relations of conflict, interference, alternation, and coexistence, but rarely as absolutes, which were the province of ideology, art critics, critics and ministers of culture. Because of the social nature of both art and politics, Gustin wasn't alone in turning to abstraction in the 50s, nor was he alone in the late 60s in seeing figuration as suddenly, seemingly possible, even urgent, and even in landing on his particular subject matter. Faith Ringgold and Rosalind Drexler, among others, had been painting the white bureaucrats and businessmen running the world since the early 60s. Next slide, please joined by Vivian Brown and Mae Stevens in the late 60s. Here's Brown on, on 
yes, the left, and um, May Stevens on the right. And you, see, you can see Stevens has explicitly picked up the hood as one of the costumes or persona of her big daddy figures. Next slide, please. Perhaps most interestingly, Benny Andrews moved from a relatively realistic depiction of the Klan in 1964 to a metaphoric use of the hood at the end of the decade. Andrews liked Gustin's work very much, and they shared an appreciation of the absurd nature of so-called real life. They also shared a strong class consciousness, class, like race, being tangled with abstraction and representation, abstraction being for the, the hoi polloi and the, hoi, the, the upper classes and, um, and representation, even cartooning being for the broad audience. The problem with abstraction was nothing inherent. It wasn't an absolute, but the class character it had taken on too much loved by wealthy collectors, the fur coats, as Gustin put it. Although they were all accused of a retrograde social realism by critics like Kramer, unlike Stevens, Ringgold, Brown, and Andrews, Gustin was not an activist in the 60s and 70s out on the streets protesting. Far from it, like most of the abstract expressionists who had survived su success, he moved, <clears throat> he moved away from the tumult of New York City to Woodstock, where he exulted in relative solitude with room and time to paint without distraction. Unlike the younger artists, Gustin did not make work specifically about racism or imperialism. Rather, he was concerned most of all with the position of the artist relative society um, in, the, in the vein of a general, generalized post-war humanism. And the, the hood portraits of um, pictures that were of the artists were the ones he loved the most and that he kept for himself. What could art possibly do in such a world? Next slide. As his figuration unspooled over the decade, that humanism became less general, less social, more concrete and specific, paying intense, atten intense attention to bodies, including those of his wife and himself, and ordinary things close at hand, including the stuff of painting itself. And that the painting, a painting of a can, paint can with brushes in it, was something he had been painting since, um, at least since 1960, and erasing, scraping down, painting over, and discarding. And he speaks of it in 1960, of something he's made and gotten rid of. Um, and then it's one of the first things he makes when he returns to figuration publicly. Um, at, the at the same time, in his view, this late style was also abstract in the strangeness that emerged from the visible world. Over the years, Gustin had despaired of both abstraction and the image for being too recognizable, too conventional. And this um, tangles up with what our, you were saying, and I think in a very complicated way, that the original impulse to abstraction, but also for Gustin towards the image, was a reaction against stereotype and against convention, things that could, could only, you could only say the same thing over and over again using conventional means. So he, his version of realism, which is a word he used throughout his career, again, during abstract periods and figurative periods, sought something that existed, um, that in fact got away from narrative, but it, because it had not yet been rendered familiar. It was not yet known. As he said, all you can do is deal with the dilemma, but really deal with the dilemma, that you're split and push that dilemma and push it and push it and push it till you're out of your mind. Then you're really in unknown territory. Thank you. Um, I might ask you a couple of questions, Kathy, if you're up for it. And, and then, of course, also all the panelists feel free to chime in. And, and um, I want to ask you, uh, you, you touched upon it, it obviously, the, the dialectic between abstraction and figuration and, and also the historical setting in which those decisions, I whether they are decisions, <laughs> are, are made. And I, I, you know, I'm in thinking also of your recent curatorial work, and, and I'm thinking of post-war because you hinted at different ideas. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about the decision of embracing abstraction in relation to, to what is representable and figurable, no? which I think is also a, a very crucial question around the uh, suspension of the show and, and the question of the, um, the hoods, uh, you know, what is legitimately uh, and what is appropriately representable. And, uh, you know, on one hand you could think, uh, and it's been read that way, not that abstraction, particularly in America, is uh, a reaction to the horror of the Holocaust and, and the impossibility of representing it. Um, how do you see uh, Gaston dealing with these questions and, you know, 
obviously the, the figurative work has been also read as references again to the Holocaust, to, to the representation of horror of the war. Um, at the same time, he's always uh, very suspicious of excessive sentimentality. You know, he makes fun of Barnett Newman and, uh, and the press release in which the sublime is mentioned and he says, uh, you know, how many meters of sublime can you buy a Knoedler or something like that. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if you have any thought about how he, you know, uh, address such themes if he did and, uh, and how this decision of uh, what was representable, what was permitted, um, he confronted and I know it's I, a big. I think I think for all, again I, I think it I think it makes Gustin I think because Gustin's so often talked about in terms of his own trajectory I think it makes him appear only more interesting to see him in the context of other artists you know grappling with some of the same questions and and after the war that is there is the Adornian position there is no art after there is no lyric or narrative art after Auschwitz you know and the idea that that was that they really had and I'm sure you know, Mark Godfrey, and maybe we'll speak to this um, this afternoon or address it in some way. Um, that it wasn't it wasn't possible to make an image adequate to the images that were coming out again in the magazines um, of the concentration camps of Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Much as he talks about the magazines with the images of Vietnam or with Chile, that you're seeing photographic images, and and but it's partly. Those images are so strong, but it's partly they feel like they felt like they didn't have a representational language. And there's a difference between figuration and representation that maybe is only interesting to super art history nerds. But they they didn't have. No one liked the word illustration, you know. So and and including Gustin talks about that um, in a negative way, but also Bacon, de Kooning, it, for all of them that was the the thing that was wrong. Um, figuration was okay. Um, and representation was very complicated. And so they, they all felt like, um, re and representation was bound up in convention and those kinds of stereotypes, but also the conventions of the art world, like Newman um, saying, you know, what are we supposed to do? Paint a picture of a lady playing the cello, of flowers in a vase after, after World War II. So um, I think what's interesting is that, is that at a later moment in the 1960s, suddenly a language becomes available. And I think in an in analogy to our moment, which people have, Rob and others, I'm sure it will come up over and over, resonance with the present, I think um, people struggled for a long time to make representations of women, of black Americans, um, of all kinds of um, dominated fractions and identities. And now we're living in a moment when figuration that is not stereotypical seems possible. So um, I think it's something that goes back and forth over and over again. And maybe from there we can jump to George's contribution. And um, I want to ask you, George, I mean, first of all, I know you've been a, a great fan of Gaston and uh, interesting enough, also Hello. a great fan of uh, De Chirico, who in turn was an inspiration for uh, for Gaston, which complicates further <laughs> everything to to think uh, of that component in in Gaston's work, but um, it should be on already. Hello. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, y you also came on to the scene or came to New York in the eighties. When this is me looking at it twenty years later, I think Gaston's figurative work began to be accepted uh, within a, a general resurgence of. Uh, figurative painting, no? Um, so I want to ask you how you encounter the work, what it meant for you. Well, I want to start with one thing. Uh, I, I mean, I, I need to take this back to a more conceptual level um, when it comes down to what a cartoon really means. I mean, I've been banned for having um, depicted adult subject matter uh, in the language of a uh, child, okay? I, I, I uh, I know what it's like, and I, I know how infuriating the cartoon itself can be when it's used to uh, depict s adult subject matter. And if you think about Gustin coming home uh, one day and finding his father hung on the porch and uh, realizing that he was racially discriminated against, um, 
and you think of the things that are hanging in his paintings, hanging light bulbs, hanging, things are always hanging. Um, they may not just simply be related to uh, things that you might see in cartoons like in Crazy Cat or in places like that. They may have a much deeper meaning to the artist and, uh, and there may be a transformation of those deeper meanings. And the shoes uh, piled up in the concentration camps um, were uh, also extremely uh, deep and, and, and hurtful and meaningful to him. And I think uh, I have to thank Hauser and Wirth for having the guts to put this show on because I think that it's a shame that uh, Gustin's work is, was deprived of being seen on a much larger uh, stage for such a great artist who was able to, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, it, it really is, he, he ridiculed uh, not only himself in showing himself as a sort of a comic figure with a big eye, staring at a bottle, lying in bed with a cigarette, looking at a clock. He ridiculed Nixon. He ridiculed the Klan. And he was um, a master of ridicule. And uh, he used the language of, uh, let's call it the cartoon, but in, the, um, in a way that was loosely brushstroked like an abstract expressionist painter would do. Because all his initial paintings, starting with the uh, what appeared or have been called the lyrical abstractions, um, started to become collectively gathered into a small uh, group of colors, orange, green, uh, a kind of ochre, and a, and a rather strange pink. And um, he relegated those colors to become his palette. And um, although he mentions Giotto and he mentions De Chirico, you can see De Chirico in the kids fighting with trash can covers, almost like the uh, gladiators with the uh, shields, you know? But I think it's, it's, it's literally a shame that the underestimation of the, uh, the black intellect to uh, think that they would not have the capability of understanding the, um, the depth of these clan paintings and to um, have some sort of a, I don't know what you want to call it, a superior board of trustees or directors that would say, oh, you know, this may cause some trouble right now because uh, we've got a BLM movement and uh, something like these Klan paintings could really spark off some trouble. And I think that's a total shame. I think it's an underestimation of the capacity of the African-American or black uh, intellectual ability to comprehend these pieces within um, the context of society that we live today. So I have to say that um, that really disgusts me, okay, number one. And um, I think that's an underestimation of uh, people's intellectual capacity to understand what Gustin could have been talking about. His whole life uh, from day one was was a very, uh, you know, it was almost depressing. I mean, he, he later portrayed himself as an insect crawling on a brick wall and saying, you know, after all that and after all this, this show that uh, they show this one painting of a brick wall with an insect, it's almost a self-portrait. And this sort of Trump-like tweet idea that they've turned it into where, uh, Gustin said, oh, this is a self-portrait, and they misinterpreted that concept when he said, the everyday man hides behind this mask, they drive around, you know, with their big fat cigars in these cars, and they uh, pretend to be, um, you know, good people. When they take those things off, they're out hanging people. And he found in his own father haunt. So, I mean, you know, this is a guy who lived through an amazing tragic moment in time and when the Vietnam War happened and when Nixon was in charge and had phlebitis, his comics of Nixon were pure ridicule. And uh, what he did was he ridiculed the abstract expressionist at a certain point. He said, I am now evolving from abstract expressionism into figuration. And I'm using the language of 
the lowest language that could possibly be used, a transgression of some sort, um, in order to reach a new height. In order to reach a new height in art, an artist must sometimes dig into the deepest and uh, the most uh, sort of unimaginable aspects of their own soul to, to reach those heights. And um, so I've always found that as an artist that whatever it is that I've rejected the most has given me uh, a subject matter for what it is that I want to um, talk about. In, uh, in my painting. And so I would just say that the, um, the way to really understand Gustin is to say this is a monumental artist, one of the greatest of our times, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, who was able to take all of these failures in American society and um, capture them in a language that also represents a sort of commonality amongst us but also a commonality that infuriates uh, the uh, high art, you know, Rosenberg, uh, Steinberg, you know, those critics who didn't want Jackson Pollock to become a figurative painter again either. I mean, often what happens in art is very strange. Chronology becomes a, um, a backward way of looking at painting. If you think of Portrait in a Dream um, by uh, Pollock, one of his last pieces. You know, this is something that uh, Greenberg um, was really against. He said, you know, you can't return to, you know, after you've done the drip paintings, how could you possibly return to, to uh, figuration? And um, that portrait in a dream was done in the 50s. But if you take a look at the late Picassos, things that were done in the late six, mid 60s, let's say 65, 66, 67, they look more like that Jackson Pollock than Jackson Pollock looks like Picasso. In the beginning, the screaming head from Guernica, okay, was an inspiration to uh, both de Kooning and um, it was used in excavation. It was, it was used in studies for those paintings. It was used by Pollock in some of his sort of uh, psychoanalytical drawings that were done based on uh, Native American uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of, in, I, I would say, in an interchangeable language between some of the sort of, um, uh, sort of American, uh, you know, American Native um, uh, drawings, okay, Native Americans, Indians. And um, in the stereotypes that were created in Hollywood of um, characters uh, were also a big part of the problem that we have in this country that um, we end up with these stereotypes. And the stereotypes are supposedly stuck in this television uh, world that we've uh, grown up with. But in fact, the uh, people that are stereotyped have a far greater intellectual capacity. If you think about what Miles Davis was able to do in improvisation or John Coltrane was able, were able to do in terms of moving music ahead. And you think about what uh, James Baldwin was writing about. If you think about what these um, artists were capable of, and you think of how Gustin appreciated that in his work. I mean, he was a kind of a jazzer, okay? As much as he was a, uh, probably a smoker, a drinker, an eater, <laughs> smoking, drinking, and eating, I think he, he very much appreciated the culture of his time. I mean, he lived in Woodstock. During Woodstock, I mean, Jimi Hendrix was up there and he played the Star Spangled Banner. And he played it in a revolt against the Vietnam War. And it, it was a, um, the work of Gustin is a total revolt against everything that abstract expressionism was all about. I mean, even Bill de Kooning went up to him and he said, what do they think we are, a baseball team? I mean, in order to sort of console him about the idea that he was being ripped to shreds for doing this kind of work. So, I mean, in my own work as an artist, I think of those guys as great heroes, mm -hmm. great heroes that were able to revolt against what it was that people expected of a painter who had sort of laid out a 
schematic of some sort to get into. I think of Jack Levine, okay, as a social realist um, in a strange way, and some of the early uh, Gustin paintings, even though, you know, when you think pre-abstract expressionism, um, some of the things that he did. But um, had, have you, if you re sort of resort to real representation, which is what we were talking about earlier, if you resort to representation, you then have to deal with things like the way someone like Pontormo or, or, or Raphael or someone like that were able to um, you know, deal with the, um, the details of fabric. And you have to think about whose line uh, really stood up in the world of um, the quality of a line let's just say, in art, which is very important when we talk about draftsmanship. And Gustin even revolted against the quality of line. His line was very different. His line was very individual. He realized, I have to have my own, you know, recognizable line. So I think, you know, I'm just obviously free-forming and bringing up a number of issues all simultaneously, but I think they all interconnect somehow in the work of Philip Gustin, I, I built up surfaces the way he built up surfaces in his paintings. I mean, I think um, I, have, I think there's a painting called Bird Brain that um, there's a slide of a painting I did. I th Can we to see me, it was a slide? bit like a Gustin painting. Yeah, that, okay, so this is heart, okay? If you look at this painting by Boslitz, we, and he had brought up Boslitz as well, 1964, take a look at that pink and those crosses, and that strange pink, and that whole bit on the whole right side, for me, is so what Gustin's palette turned into, okay? As simultaneously, in, in a strange way, Boslitz and Gustin are kind of the more uh, similar painters in a strange way. There's another painting called The Lovers by, um, by uh, uh, by Boslitz, I, I asked for a slide of that, which I think feels like some of the abstraction. I don't know if you can show that slide. Um, I I don't mean to sound disrespectful. I think that Boslitz could use some of Gaston's self uh, skepticism. I, I think that <laughs> particularly in this moment of his what, career. Well, what's <laughs> really interesting about it is that even if you look at those figures to the left, you know, I mean, what's what's what I find interesting is that in 1980, early 80 or 81, whenever it was that the Whitney did the show of uh, the retrospective of uh, Augustine, at the same time, Xavier Fourcade Gallery had showed a really interesting show of um, Boslitz, and they were the drinkers. And uh, the drinkers and Boslitz with the sort of eye on the bottle and the and the Boslitz paintings of the drinkers were, um, in a strange way, the most connected thing I could find in uh, terms of abstract expressionist and figurative painting. Um, but again, I could always see the, f the the greens, yellows, and ochre tones and the pinks coming together out of this one moment of the lyrical abstraction, and then suddenly they formed into uh, characters. And these characters became trademark um, sort of figures in his paintings. Um, and I think that surrealism was, again, like one of the precursors of a way out of uh, figurative painting. It was a way out of representation. It was a sort of, the idea of surrealism was that it was a sort of a transcription of a dream or a um, potential dream-like situation. But in fact, it was not really a dream. It was a constructed uh, reality that represented a dream. And so these are somewhat constructed. Um, I don't know uh, if you can show anything else besides this painting on the slide. Oh, yeah, so there's another one where you have that feeling where you feel that sort of pink and the brush strokes and the the sort of freedom of um, of just compositional freedom, 
limited to a certain amount of colors. And then <coughs> lastly, I, j I just wanted to show one painting I did, because um, I didn't want to really talk about myself all that much. But this one, Bird Brain, um, was a painting that started with a number of um, sort of patches of colors and organization of forms and finally just sort of boiled down to this one somewhat effervescent head with these two large eyes that are very much out of Dustin. <laughs> you know, that he's a real influence to, um, he's an unavoidable um, uh, giant for uh, contemporary art. And th there's no way around, I mean, certain artists claim territories in, in art, you know, that's what you do. And uh, Picasso claimed a lot of territory as a painter. Um, you know, the conversion of St. Paul, uh, what, what you showed from the Piazza del Popolo, this uh, Caravaggio had created, it claimed so much territory with the concept of uh, what he was doing that it spread all the way to Holland, the, it, and it spread all the way around to the Caravaggisti. And um, so I think the idea of combining these languages together and uh, dealing with the interchangeability of languages and the interchangeability of um, changes as well in society make for art uh, to evolve in our time. And I, I think it's all about evolution and understanding of um, humanity. And I think what the, one of the great contributions that Philip Guston uh, gave us was his 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 uh, sort of replete understanding of humanity and all its faults, all its failures, and all of its um, triumphs in the form and materialized form of painting. Well, that could be maybe a, a good ending. <laughs> I don't know if we are taking questions or questions to each other, or are we taking questions? We we can we, we can take questions if there's uh, if there's anyone out there who has one for the panel. That's good. <laughs> speak, we left them speechless. Speak now or for oh wait, we do. There is a microphone. Yeah. I think there. If you feel like it. Or we can bring the microphone to you. Okay, be, that because it's been um, recorded, yeah. like everything in life. You said humanity. W where does this go? Are we, are we, we are left in the ether thinking about everything that goes and becomes the material that we're, we're seeing visually or we're hearing or we're reading, we're moved by? I think of the materialization of an image is a understanding of humanity, that there's a subconscious and there's a conscious sort of um, acceptance of what's going on. I think some of it is locked within our subconscious and that Gustin was able to tap into that subconscious in his own way and be able to soulfully express it and make it material so that it was, it will exist in space. It will be there. It won't go away like music is played and then after you've heard it, it's gone. But with a painting, it just stays on the wall and so there's a lot of thought that goes into painting to say, you know, I, I'm, this is an improvisation on the idea of my understanding of humanity, but yet it's a concrete, uh, con you know, sort of um, representation of that thought, you know. It, it, it's the materialization of a thought, and that's what a painting really is ultimately. It is just paint on a canvas. And many times he, in this last exhibition, there's just a giant hand holding on to a canvas and there's a sort of a sun setting on it. And you think about that, that being just 
hanging on to a canvas, you know, and to say like, this is all I have to express my most inner feelings. This could go, it could go poof, unfortunately. Well, I and mean, if you, if you screw up a painting, you know, the great thing is that you can always go back and repaint it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about other things, nature taking over. Yeah, what so is, surrounding. I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Uh, we were just asking, uh, just the atmosphere, the environment can take all of that materiality and make it go away. I mean, you can't make it go away. You, you, you have to inform it in such a way that the, um, that the um, social change is, um, is, is, is brought to the forefront and that people can learn from it and people can say that these things are um, signals of ways of moving forward and, and that, that that's what the, uh, the point of this is, is to, um, not only to evolve as a painter and to evolve as a, you know, and be able to put that into material form, but that society itself could materially change and to become more sort of, um, I don't know, equitable or, 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 or make, make those changes that are necessary uh, in order to sort of respect um, the, um, the intellectual, like I said, the intellectual capacity of those, of those people from, diverse cultures and, and, and begin to understand them and let their uh, sort of um, languages speak the way that, you know, within our um, sort of limited, you know, world of just being painters, we try to incorporate all of these uh, sort of, you know, we try to incorporate as much as we can about our own personal feelings of to some degree, uh, you know, witnessing the audacities of our world that we live in today. And we put it down on canvas and we say, you know, this is how I feel right now. How is that gonna affect uh, society? You know, will society act the way, you know, will politicians act the way painters act? Will they take opposing colors and opposing forms and opposing shapes, and will they find a way to harmonize those things in a canvas in such a way that they become an artwork? Can they possibly make this dialectical sort of, you know, uh, you know, leap, you know, where you can harmonize opposition in in such a way that you end up with a beautiful world? That's what painters try to do. That, but I wish the politicians would. <laughs> Thanks. That's another good ending, I think. We'll just stop there. Thank you so much. <laughs>